All right, so now a little bit about me. My name is Scott Varney. I am a capital gains tax strategist. I'm in my seventh year as such. I started as a one-trick pony, and now I teach on multiple strategies. Yesterday, I had 309 attendees on a webinar that uh, we walked through about 14 different capital gains tax strategies. My background is I... I'm still licensed for real estate in Texas, but now I just do referrals and I will be building a real estate team eventually. Um, I've been licensed since 1996, so I just did my continuing education during the Christmas holidays to renew my license in February. So been doing that for a long time. So I can I can relate to a lot of the real estate professionals that, who bring me clients, so I can have great conversations with them. At one point, I, I was closing anywhere from 50 to 61 real estate clients per year as a real estate agent. So, uh, yes, I ran like a madman. Um, I'd have as many as 15 closings in a month. So it was crazy, but uh, I was blessed uh, to have such good business. I'm currently, as I mentioned already, in financial services. I deal with a life and long-term care insurance as well as fixed and indexed annuities. And I'm part of a team that has a world-class financial advisor. So a little bit about how I operate when it comes to sales or planning. There are two types of professionals. There are those that try to make a client fit their product or their solution. And many of you have probably experienced that where somebody is trying to make you fit into that box to convince you that it's a good fit. Then there are those that try to find the product or solution that actually fits the client. And that's what I do. I look at a case. I will try to figure out the numbers, the goals, the personality, and see what is out there that makes sense for that individual. And sometimes I will tell them, uh, I've, did, I've done this already twice this week with people, it's better to pay the tax bill. And here's why. And quite often they go, well, that makes a lot of sense. So again, I'm one of those that tries to find a product or solution that fits the client. That's who I am and how I operate my capital gains tax strategy business. Now, while this is general information about a complex spendthrift trust, it does not constitute legal advice. The best way to get guidance on your specific legal issue is to contact an attorney. Now, in America, there are two tax systems, one for the informed, and one for the uninformed. Both are legal. So, and I like that quote from Judge Learned Hand, and you may be about to step from the uninformed to the informed if you haven't heard about this type of tax planning before. Now, here's another great quote. The biggest scam in life is paying taxes on the money we make, paying taxes on the money we spend, and taxes on the things we own that we already pay taxes on with already taxed money. And many of you are probably going, oh, yeah, I feel that all the time. So today we're going to talk about a tax deferral and asset protection type of trust. I call it a complex spendthrift trust. There are many names for it out there. Uh, I just simply name it after two of the many provisions in the trust. Now, Nelson Rockefeller said it best. The secret to success is to own nothing but control everything. Again, own nothing but control everything. A complex spendthrift trust can solve the following problems. So I'm going to start out with the problems that we face. First problem, people I talk to all the time, 10, 15, up to 25 people in a week. They have capital gains taxes and very significant capital gains taxes many times. Now, when I say significant, I don't mean that it's always millions of dollars. I had somebody that I met with out of Arkansas, and it was a $15,000 capital gains tax bill. And to them, that was the world. So, you know, that is an issue. And, and so we have to address that first problem, which is the capital gains taxes. Another problem. The 1031 exchange stressors. I talk to people all the time that are doing 1031 exchanges. There's 45 days to identify a property and 180 days to close the identified property. Well, with those rules, as a friend of mine who's an accommodator says, the crazy rules, 
40 to 60 percent of exchanges will fail based on the market and the market conditions. That's a problem. And that causes a lot of stress. Actually, people will end up buying something that they wouldn't have bought if they were not in, a, in an exchange because they have to complete the exchange or pay the tax. And I've talked to people who have said, if I would have known that I was going to end up with this property, I would have never sold the other property. That's a problem. The current 1031 exchange proposals that are out there is they, they've proposed to cap the amount that you get to defer in an exchange to $500,000 per spouse. So if you're married, it's a million dollars in a year. If you sell an industrial building for $4 million and there's $2 million in capital gains, you can defer, if you're married, a million dollars of that and you have to pay tax on the other million unless you have a strategy to mitigate those taxes. And that's per year. So you, the next year it cycles again to where it's up to a million. But that is a problem, especially if you have more expensive real estate. I live in Silicon Valley. Steffi and April are in Silicon Valley. Out here, you can't even buy a porta potty for half a million. So there's a lot of capital gains taxes. Problem number three, income taxes that reduce return on investment. So let's walk that through a little bit. Rental income minus expenses, minus your mortgage, Minus is the minus the taxes that you paid on the income, all the plus yeah you know all the expenses being the property management and repairs and all that, quite often leads to discouragement or a questioning of whether or not you can be getting a better return on investment somewhere else. Many people have done wonderfully with real estate; they've built a lot of wealth. But you know what? There are many people that have not done so well. And they're getting a 1% or 2% return on investment. I've actually talked to many people that do that. And they complain about that. And so that is a problem. Real estate isn't always a great wealth builder. It can be, but it isn't always a great wealth builder. Problem number four, future tax hikes. Now, I follow the Tax Foundation for any updates on proposed tax laws. So at this time, to the best of my knowledge, the, they are they have proposed to raise the top capital gains bracket to 39.6% of any gains over a million. The top bracket right now is 20%. That's an almost double increase. The bracket under the million would be, they propose to be 28%. Now, understand this. When they say a million, that doesn't mean capital gains only. They take your income plus your capital gains to determine your bracket. Then they separate it and then you pay ordinary income taxes on your income and then your capital gains taxes. So if you have 700000 in capital gains, but you and a spouse combined make 350000 that puts you over the million and into the top bracket. They've proposed to eliminate the step up in basis. What is that? So if you bought a property for 200000 and you sell it for a million, you have 800000 in capital gains minus any expenses, deductible expenses. So that's a big tax bill. Now, if you bought it for 200000 that's your original cost basis, and you pass away and it's worth a million, your beneficiaries get a step up in the cost basis from 200000 to a million dollars. So if they sell immediately, there's little to no capital gains taxes. If they hold on to the property for a significant amount of time, their cost basis is still a million. So that significantly reduces the capital gains taxes. They've proposed to eliminate that. Well, they, I don't know, but that's a proposal. I've already talked about the capping the exchange and they have proposed to reduce the estate tax or we also know it as the death tax exemption which has been 12.92 million, they want to reduce it to three and a half million per spouse. That's a significant drop. But understand this, it's already designed that based on the 2017 Tax Act, that that exemption is going to drop to about six million per spouse in 2026. So already we're going to see a drop, but they propose to drop it even farther. 
Now, <clears throat> problem number five, lawsuits. I, it's hard to find solid asset protection. You really have to do a lot of homework to find the asset protection. Problem number six, corporations such as S-Corps and LLCs don't protect you as well as you think. See, it's easy to pierce the corporate veil because they are tightly held entities. Basically, you're operating under what is called your alter ego. The claims, the courts claim that you are controlling the owner of the entity, which is a winnable argument with a judge. So the alter ego status with the LLCs and S-Corps provide the opportunity for it to be pierced. And people will do this where they put all their real estate in one LLC or they might open an LLC for each property so that every property is with an independent LLC for asset protection. And it's helpful, but it's not as solid as you think it is. Roughly 50% of entities can be pierced because they are not operating the business properly when it comes to the records, the meetings, and the minutes. If those records were pulled into court, that's an easy way to pierce the corporate veil. Actually, with these trusts, once you set that up, you don't have to deal with those meetings and corporate minutes anymore. <clears throat> now, here's the reality of how much protection you have. Wake Forest University did a study. They found that on average, between state courts and federal courts, 40% of those corporate structures were pierced in court. That's a 4 in 10 chance that you could still lose all of your assets, which means there's a 6 in 10 chance that you won't lose the assets. So it's helpful, but it's not a guarantee. <clears throat> Problem number seven. This is going to be a shocker to many of you. Insurance is only a partial solution and not the solution. Why is that? Umbrella policies often do not cover punitive damages or gross negligence. What is that? You run a red light. You hit someone. You lose in a lawsuit. $3 million is the award. You go, okay, I've got, I've got enough in my umbrella policy to cover that. And then the insurance company says, no. You see right here? It says we do not cover gross negligence. You ran a red light. You broke the law. That's gross negligence. And then a portion of that award, award let's say, let's say two and a half million of that is what's called punitive damages, meaning they're punishing you for actually running the red light. That may not be covered either. So you need to go back to your insurance agent and find out if you have umbrella insurance, what is actually covered. You may still want to keep it. I have trust. I have these trusts. I also have the umbrella insurance because there is a value to it, but don't assume that you're fully covered. Here's another shocker, and I just updated this list, oh, two weeks ago. <clears throat> Problem number eight, filial responsibility statute. Many states have fil filial responsibility statutes, which allows long-term care facilities to seize the assets of adult children to cover unpaid bills of their parents. So what does that mean? Mom is in a care facility. At this point, she's in dementia. It's costing $25,000 a month. It takes two or three billing cycles before the facility realizes she doesn't have the money. Because maybe, maybe they had a change of management or whatever it is, but mom owes $75,000. Mom doesn't have $75,000. In these states that are listed here, the facility can turn to the adult children and say, you need to pay that $75,000. And the child goes, I don't have that. So that means that they can seize an asset to cover that $75,000. That's, that's huge. That Most people do not know that that is out there. And I got the updated list from the trustandwill.com site. Problem number nine, Corporate Transparency Act. Now, this came into effect on January 1st of 2024, this year. This is a means to watch for money laundering. Now, 
I've talked to people that, you know, they're, oh, I think on some level they react and overreact to these kinds of things. The reason for this act is because there's a lot of money laundering going on. I mean, I've had issues even at my bank and they're always watching for that money laundering. Even now to where if I go to deposit money at my bank, I cannot, if I deposit a check, I cannot put on that uh, deposit slip cash back. I have to actually do a different uh, slip to get cash back straight from the account because of all the money laundering going on. So this is a means to protect uh, Americans from money laundering as well as, you know, people breaking the law. However, every corporate structure that is registered with a state and statutory trust, not federal contract trust, but statutory trust that do state tax reporting will have to file a beneficial ownership information agreement with uh, FinCEN is what we call it, but the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. So basically you actually have to share all of your beneficiaries and everything uh, with FinCEN if you have corporate structures. And for some people, that is an issue for them. They don't feel like the government should be involved in their business. Okay, understandable. So these trusts will, you do not have to file such a form. So again, there's benefits and there's, you know, there's the concern that even more so the government is getting involved in our business. Now, what they're doing to force this is that you, if you do not comply with the CTA, it could be up to 10,000 in penalties and up to two years of imprisonment. So if you do have corporate structures, you need to uh, talk to your tax professional about uh, filing the um, beneficial ownership information form. And again, for those who want more, uh, they want less transparency about what's going on with their life and their assets, this trust gives you that uh the ability to keep things close to your vest, as they say. Now, what's the solution? So we're going to talk about a trust. Remember I said that I call it a complex spendthrift trust because I'm using a couple of the provisions in that. Um, so this is non-statutory. This is not self-settled. This is complex, which is actually the tax code, even though these are very complex. This is a... Both discretionary provisions, spendthrift provisions, non-grantor provisions, and irrevocable provisions. The primary purpose of this trust is both tax deferral and asset protection. Now, this is significantly more beneficial than, say, a living trust, which only keeps you out or your beneficiaries out of probate court. If you have a uh, if you have a will, you might still your beneficiaries might still be in court for eighteen months to two or three or four years. And so the living trust is there to keep them out so that everything's cleaned up and done and closed up within, say, three weeks. This goes well beyond that kind of benefit. So let's address this in a little bit more detail, not self-settled. Self-settled trust is a type of trust in which the settler is also the person who is to receive the benefits from the trust. They are the beneficiary of the trust. These are spendthrift trusts that the settler forms for his or her own benefit. In such trusts, the settler and beneficiary are one and the same person. This is done for protecting the trust assets from creditors. However, most U.S. states do not recognize self-settled trusts. So this is not self-settled. You are not the settler and you are not the beneficiary. So that's very important to know. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more later. Non-statutory. These trusts are based on federal contract law, affirming the right to contract. It is not based on state or what we call statutory laws. Therefore, it is not required to follow simple tax codes, which requires distributions to the beneficiaries. That's very important. Plus, my trust was drawn up in Texas, and I'm in California. So you can cross state boundaries, whereas my friend that uh, I interviewed for my subscription service on Living Trust, he did a great job on the um, dirty dozen uh, list of estate planning mistakes. Well, he can only work in California and draw up trusts in California. That's not the case with these federal contract law trusts. 
the complex provision. This trust can alternate between simple or complex codes depending on the circumstances. This defers capital gains taxes for decades or generations, tens or hundreds or thousands of years. So that that's an important provision in this trust. This helps to, to defer income taxes for the self-employed, depending on how much of that goes into the trust. Again, this is dual track, complex and simple provisions um, are applied to the trust depending on the situation. Now, um, actually, there is a uh, Forbes article written in 2020 that talks about eliminating capital gains using a complex trust. So we don't talk about eliminating capital gains. We talk about deferring the capital gains. But even here with Forbes, they were saying that there's a tool that many of the wealthy use for tax mitigation, and it's the complex trust. The discretionary provision, this provision defers capital gains taxes for generations as well. Also, it can help to defer some income taxes paid by the self-employed. So this gives you the discretion on whether or not you are going to distribute to beneficiaries, which is where we get into uh, the tax code and how to defer the taxes. So the complex and discretionary provisions provide the tax deferral benefits. Spendthrift provision. This is the one provision that works for both asset protection and tax deferral. So it's a multifunctional provision within the trust, both asset protection and tax deferral. The non-grantor provision provides ironclad asset protection. Remember, I said it's not self-settled. You are not the grantor. You are considered the non-grantor trustee of the trust. So the non-grantor provision in a trust separates the creator or settler from the corpus of the trust. That's the body of the trust and exempts the trust from any alter ego status. Remember how I said that the corporations can be pierced because of that alter ego status? Here, with the non-grantor provision, that eliminates and exempts the trust from that type of piercing. And that's very important to know. By the way, one last thing to consider about grantor trusts is that the IRS labels all abusive tax schemes as either grantor trust or foreign trust. That's an important insight. The grantor's role is they're credited with creating the trust, funding the trust, appointing the guardian and trustee, which is the client, and then they resign from the trust. When they resign from the trust and then you take over as the trustee of the trust, then you can sell assets to the trust. So there are no assets in the trust upon the resignation of the grantor. The irrevocable provision also provides ironclad asset protection. Um, the irrevocable trust is one that by its terms cannot be revoked. This is very different than a revocable trust, which allows a grantor to revoke the trust, at which time the assets revert to the grantor. The assets in an irrevocable trust are generally beyond the reach of creditors and judgments. Now, if you're going to have solid asset protection, you want to have irrevocable provision, the non-grantor provision, and the spendthrift provision. The combination of those provisions makes it really, really solid. Now, assets transfer the trust, transferred to the trust may never revert to the one who established the trust. So this provision makes it so that, remember, the grantor that's credited with creating the trust, they resign you are going to sell assets to the trust. So eventually, if the trust comes to an end, which every trust has an ending date, but this can be renewed, when the trust comes to an end, this provision protects the um, legacy and the assets from reverting back to the original grantor. They cannot go back to that grantor. So that's a protection for the client. Now, there are two exceptions found with when it comes to the spendthrift provisions in terms of um, the in court cases where the trusts were pierced. See, the corpus of a spendthrift trust is not subject to turnover orders by any court or judge, whether federal, state, or local. 
The two exceptions that have been found are fraudulent conveyance. You've lost a lawsuit. Now you're going to go hide all your assets in a trust. Nah, doesn't work that way. And back child support, court ordered child support. Somebody was trying to do the same thing, which is really similar to fraudulent conveyance. So they were trying to hide their assets now so that they would not have to pay child support. Those are the only two times that we have seen where such a trust has been pierced. And that's very important to know. So that means that this is really solid asset protection. There are case rulings supporting the Spendthrift Trust. Now, I want you to note this. There is not a lot of case law for capital gains tax strategies. There's not a lot. You have the Starker case going back to 1979 with 1031 exchanges. Spendthrift Trusts also have case law. Beyond that, just not a lot of case law. So everything is in the gray. Now, this is what I've learned from a tax attorney who is a tax litigator who fights the IRS in tax court. She has the license to go to tax court. And she said everything's in the gray. And therefore, everything has to be fact determinative on a case-by-case basis. How it is set up, how it is managed, and how it is reported really determines the legality of a transaction. We have case law supporting spendthrift provisions, but again, there's not a lot out there. So that you know. Now, these trusts follow Scott on trust law, and that's not me, and that's not the other Scott you see picture here. Um, That is what many trust professionals call the trust Bible. So Scott on trust law, it follows the restatement of trust, the internal revenue code, the IRS code, the uniform trust code, the uniform prudent investor act, the uniform commercial code, the statute of fraud, frauds, and the rule against perpetuities. It has to apply all of these rules. And therefore, um, that's what makes it legal. And the trust can be drawn up for you anywhere in the U.S. and is applicable to where you live. Because these, again, these follow con- federal contract law and the right to contract, and they are not statutory. This trust has an option to renew every 21 years. Because remember, by law, the rule against perpetuities means that a trust cannot be set up to never die or never come to an end. It has to have an ending date. So with these trusts, they end every 21 years. You can always renew it with the stroke of a pen for another 21 years. So that can go on generation after generation after generation. So it can be 10, 20, 30 generations, hundreds of years, a thousand years. The trust will be taxed either when the trustee decides to not renew it or 21 years after the last heir to the last beneficiary has passed away. Now, the roots of this type of trust come from a legacy class of trusts. You'll see Rockefellers, Carnegie's, Kennedy's have trusts that help to pass on legacy with tax mitigation as well as asset protection. So this is a kind of class of trust that gets into what the wealthy have done. Spencer trusts actually have been around for five or six hundred years. So it's not a new type of concept. So let's break this down into a little bit more simple terms. There are five living benefits of the complex spendthrift trust. You have ultimate asset invisibility. Remember that um, Transparency Act I was talking about here? Here you have invisibility. You, um, the trust has its own EIN number and it is not a statutory trust. Therefore, what goes on, who the trustees are and whatnot, you have a lot more uh, invisibility with that. The ultimate asset protection. Again, I, you know, the complex, uh, the spendthrift, irrevocable, and non grantor provisions give you the ultimate in asset protection, which means that you have the ultimate asset control. I mean, let's think about this. If you can lose everything in the lawsuit, how much control do you really have? But if you can't lose it in a lawsuit, then um, you have much more control. By the way, quick side note, rabbit trail. A friend of mine said that when he was in law school in the 90s, a professor told him, told the students, got their attention. He says, I don't pay for malpractice insurance. And everybody's like, what? He's like, I have one of these types of trusts set up. I have one of these trusts set up. All my assets are in there. So 
go ahead and sue me. You can't have my assets. See, he had control of his assets. He can't lose them. You can, you can choose to have that kind of asset control as well. Um, and then the ultimate in tax benefits. This is the most dynamic tax tool I have found yet. And I know of a lot of tax strategies and I'm still learning more tax strategies, but this is the most tax uh, dynamic tax tool when it comes to capital gains and income taxes that I've seen. And then when you have all of these, you have true peace of mind that you are managing your tax you know, obligations well, your assets are protected. You can really rest and have true peace of mind. So which tax code makes this possible? Because people ask me, is this legal? Okay, let's get into that a little bit. According to multiple attorney opinion letters, and I've read multiple opinion letters, so I've kind of taken from all of that. And the following tax codes are referenced in the opinion letters. Title 26, subchapter, subtitle A, chapter 1, subchapter 1, part 1, sections 59, 67, 543, 553, 927, subpart A. Section 641, Section 643, subparts A, B, C, and D, and Section 651 and 672 to 678. All of these tax codes are applied to the trust. That's significant. Now, when you talk to promoters of such trust, they will focus on one. And that is tax code 643. In there, you'll see the two highlighted parts. Gains from the sale or exchange of capital assets shall be excluded from paying taxes that year to the extent that such gains are allocated to corpus, that's the body of the trust, that's your bank accounts and other assets in the trust, and are not, A, paid, credited, or required to be distributed to any beneficiary during the taxable year. That is the key. As long as you do not distribute to beneficiaries because this trust is set up for beneficiaries, you are the caretaker of the assets for the beneficiaries. The discretionary provision gives you the power to choose to not distribute to a beneficiary. So that's the key. Here it says on the bottom, items of gross income constituting extraordinary dividends or taxable stock dividends. That that doesn't mean like Apple stock or anything like that. Um, I like what Scott says. You have a cow. The cow is the stock. The milk is the dividend. So that can apply much more broadly than what many people think, which the fiduciary, that is the trustee, that could be you, acting in good faith, determines to be allocable to corpus. Again, the extraordinary dividends, taxable stock dividends are allocated to the corpus of the trust based on the trust documents. Under the terms of the governing instrument, the trust and applicable local law shall not be considered income. That's huge. And so, and that is defensible as, um, and I'm going to get into that. So what is not considered income to the trust by the IRS? So what we're talking about here, what's going to be deferred is what is considered passive income, rental income royalty income, interest income, dividend income, K-1 passive income, and then capital gain income are all considered passive income that can be deferred. Now, some of the assets that are sold by the trust, you have Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, stocks and bond market trading. This does not work for qualified funds. So if you have a 401k, a 403b, an IRA, that does not work for those types of Funds, because you have already established a partnership with the government that instead of paying taxes on 10000 see, the government knows what they're doing. Instead of paying taxes on $10,000, you're going to be paying taxes on, say, $160,000. That's a wonderful partnership for the government. Real estate, business, business sales, and things like art and antiques that have capital gains uh, issues if it grows in value a lot. Now, one thing to understand about this trust, unlimited amount of assets can be sold with one trust. Most other strategies are transactional in that you pay the fees for every individual transaction you complete. I was talking to my wife and she said, okay, so is this trust, you know, how does this trust cost compared to this other strategy? 
I'm like, well, if you sell a million dollar asset with this other strategy, it's going to be sixty three to sixty four thousand dollars for the one asset. Whereas when you set up the trust, you can sell multiple assets. So that's important to know. Intellectual property provisions can be added to the trust, so you can defer taxes on income derived on uh, intellectual property, such as books, membership sites, coaching, mastermind programs, home study courses, and consulting. Now, this is really important to to understand. This there is an audit that was sent to the trust division of the IRS, and it was passed with no change from the trust division. All of the no change audits I know of find the strength of the tax reporting in tax code 643. That's what they will typically go to to defend it, even though there's about 15 codes that apply to these trusts. So a no change letter is really important um, because you have what is called, you'll see here, affirmative defense. Now, Typically, trust organizations work with independent tax professionals that are not within their organization, but you have independent tax professionals doing all the tax reporting. That's what they do. I have an independent tax team that does my tax reporting for my two trusts. And when you have someone, a tax professional that has had a client that has been audited and the results are no change, From that audit from the IRS, they have what is called affirmative defense. They can use those no change letters for defending other clients should they be audited and if they have the same structure. Now, I have two tax professionals. I still have one that uh, does my personal tax reporting and my S corporation reporting. I want to retire them and then I'll move everything to the other team. Now, my CPA cannot use a no change letter from another tax professional. Only that tax professional can use that to defend their clients. Now, the, and note here again, that this was done as a, um, that this went to the trust division. So they reviewed the documents and came back with no change. Now, I love what Lucy Parsons once said, Never be deceived that the rich will permit you to vote away their wealth. So people will ask, what if they change the tax code? They can change it. That's what they do up in Washington. Now, this is part of the original tax code that was ratified in 1918. So it's been around for 105 years. 1031 exchanges weren't put into law until 1921. So this has been around a long time. And the only change to this code was they added a little bit to it. They have not eliminated the code in that 105 years. Can they do that? Absolutely. But you have to remember that the those in Washington not only have built wealth, but they also need to protect the wealth of their constituents and the people who actually fund them. So you're never going to see Washington get rid of all the tax codes that help the rich. Just the way it is. Now, I'm going to get ahead of something here while we're talking about tax codes. There was a recent memorandum that was made public on August 9th of 2023. So what happens here, this is is a pattern that I see happening since that came out. The uninformed CPA is telling the uninformed prospective client that those who are promoting such types of trust are uninformed in regard to the IRS and the law. So that's what's been happening. So I'm going to take you from the uninformed to the informed here so that if you decide to do your research and your CPA, who is more often than not just a um, plug and play uh, tax preparer, when they send this to you, you actually understand more about the memorandum than they do. So the initial verbiage in the memorandum states that this memorandum may not be used or cited as precedent. Why is that? Well, here's what you have from the government, IRS government site on technical advice memorandums. And 
I have in bold here, technical advice memoranda are used only on closed transactions and provide the interpretation of proper application of tax laws, tax treaties, regulations, revenue rulings, or other precedents. The advice rendered represents a final determination of the position of the IRS, but only with respect to the specific issue in the specific case in which the advice is issued. That's to a specific case. So many times promoters of tax strategies will see a memorandum out there and they say, hey, this works as long as everything is within um, the structure of the same structure as what was uh, analyzed by the IRS. But the IRS will say, no, you can't use as uh, as precedents. Now, one thing to note on this memoranda, the attorney that wrote it actually only reviewed the promotional materials and not the contract. That's huge. Memoranda are typically based on a fact-determinative approach, how it's set up, how it's managed, and how it's reported with all facts to that case. So all of the tax reporting plus any uh, associated contracts or documents. And in this case, there's not a complete set of facts to de derive an informed opinion. They did not look at the facts. As a matter of fact, they admitted that they did not look at any trust contracts. That's a red flag right there. Therefore, they did not address any questions about a transaction with contractual protection, which that's what these contracts are. They have It's built on contractual protections. And they did not address the question on whether any of the gross income described in the structure constitutes an extraordinary dividend under tax code 643. So that's really important to know. They only looked at somebody's promotional materials. I don't know who that is. And based on the verbiage in the memorandum, they used verbiage that is not applied to our organization or the trust that we do. Now, beyond that, so remember, everything's fact determinative, a memorandum that looks at the facts. They did not see facts except for promotional materials. The attorney, this is going to be critical for you if you hear from your CPA. The attorney refers to the trust as a self-styled trust. Most people won't even read the memorandum. They just see the title of it and say, okay, things are illegal. They're not doing their homework. The attorney refers to the trust as a self-styled trust. Now remember I said earlier that this is not self-settled or self-styled. That means that the one setting up the trust, the settler or grantor, is also the one receiving all the benefits or as the beneficiary, and they are typically statutory trusts. The settler and grantor and the beneficiary are actually the same person. These trusts are not self-settled or self-styled. Our clients are neither the settler, grantor, or the beneficiary. These are legacy trusts designed to uh, pass on your assets to the next generation, and you are simply the caretaker of the trust. Um, so these are the facts that were not reflected in the technical advice memorandum. So just be aware of that, that's, that, that's out there. And, you know, you are, now you are now more informed than your CPA who gives you the memorandum. Moving on, I'm not going to spend a lot more time on that. Um, so but I just want you to be informed. We work with full transparency. We're not afraid to actually deal with the issues out there. Now, which corporate structures does this work for? If you're looking to try to mitigate taxes on income as a business owner, this works best with LLCs and C-Corps. For real estate, if an S-Corp owns it, then the S-Corp election will need to be revoked in order to get the capital gains deferral. That is if the underlying entity is an LLC. So the S Corp is just an election. There's an underlying entity. It could be the uh, LLC or it could be incorporated. And this takes a bit of time because there are date uh, restrictions as to when you can revoke and when it actually applies. If the underlying entity of the S Corp is an Inc., then nothing can be done in regards to the trust. We have other options, but you're kind of stuck. Um, for self-employed businesses, LLCs and C-Corps provide the best tax mitigation. 
Corps have more limited tax benefits because S Corp is required to pay reasonable W-2 wages. And this trust does not help with W-2 wages. So already that's off the table for tax mitigation with the trust. And there, you know, the dividends that are being paid out beyond the W-2, maybe some of that can be mitigated. And by the way, I have an S Corp and it actually works out fine for me here. Um, you should almost never put real estate, the bonus insight, in an S Corp. You eliminate the flexibility of transferring ownership of the property to you or other entities without creating a taxable event. So if you move it to being under your name instead of the S Corp, that's a taxable distribution. You lose flexibility. Um, and that's important to note. So if you decide to shut down the S Corp, and put the property in your name because you don't want to deal with the S-Corp anymore. Plan to pay the taxes at that time because it's going to be, that transfer is going to be at actual market value. Now, active business income. The trust can defer active income taxes paid by those who are self-employed. Again, this does not work for W-2 employees unless they have a side business. Any business you're current actively working in or you're putting in the hours, you can have a 50 to 90% reduction on your annual tax liability, depending on your business, how your business is structured along with your needs and goals. The range is on a case by case basis. So you're not eliminating those taxes. You are deferring that, those taxes. You're kicking that tax bucket down the road for decades or generations. And by doing that, you can grow your wealth even more and your assets even more. As an example, if you have a $50,000 tax bill as a self-employed person, it can be potentially reduced to between $5,000 and $25,000. That's a huge reduction. That's a, you know, here in California, that might buy us five extra trips to Starbucks. Of course, I'm kidding, but uh, it is what it is out here. We pay a weather tax. As I tell people, we love the weather, so we stick around and pay the tax. Now, an ideal scenario, you could operate straight from your business trust, but remember that no change letter I talked to you about? Um, it was built on a structure where someone has an LLC to run the business. They have two trusts, a business trust that follows the simple tax codes and a beneficial trust that has the assets that follows the complex codes. So what they had set up is an LLC, they made the business trust a 90% limited partner of the LLC. So 90% of the profit goes to the business trust and the money in needs to be money out because it's following simple tax code. So if it brings in $20,000, you need to spend $20,000. So that $20,000 is paid out to the beneficial trust. By doing that, you can defer 90% of the actual taxes. That's huge. Now the beneficial trust is what's going to get the tax deferral. So, and I have a business trust as well. So I actually live according to what I'm talking about today with utilizing these trusts for tax mitigation. Now you set up an LLC to run the business, uh, make a business trust, a 90% limited partner of the LLC. If you, if you have multiple business owners, partners, and that's the only business that you have, it makes sense sometimes to just have one business trust set up. Instead of everybody setting up their own business trust, have one business trust set up. Then everybody sets up their own beneficial trust and the business trust basically distributes the passive income to each owner's trust. So you reduce the cost that way by having the one. If you have partnerships in business, but you have other businesses, you'll, you'll want to have your own business trust. So that can work out really great so that all the partners can have a uh, 90% tax mitigation. However, if some partners don't want to participate with that, then if your partnership is an LLC, a multi-member LLC, then just have the um, business trust be 90% limited partner for your portion of that ownership. Now, short-term rentals, 
Airbnb, Verbo, um, depending on the tax professional you talk to, some would say that it counts as passive income. Others would say, no, that that is active income. So if you have short-term rentals and, you know, like the Airbnb and Verbo, you may need to have a business trust that's collecting the income. So that's where the tax professional will guide you as to what is the best approach to take. Now let's break it down. Let's get very practical. We're getting close to the end. Next is trust rules. It Own nothing but control everything until you die. That's the Rockefeller approach. If the trust owns it, the trust always pays the bill, not you. That's important because people go, well, how do I get money out of the trust to pay my bills? Well, you're going to try and transfer as many of your bills as possible to the trust. Never pay bills with after-tax money when the trust can pay for it with pre-tax money. This can save you 20 to 30% on every bill. For example, if you have a home, primary residence, it's right now you're paying all of those bills with after-tax money. You move it into the ownership of the trust, income into the trust can pay for it with pre-tax money. Your money goes farther. The trust is required to pay for all health, medical, and welfare costs of the beneficiaries, trustees, and guardians. All education uh, costs for beneficiaries under the age of 21, as long as they're full-time in, in school, it can pay for their schooling as well. And, and that's really important to know. So like in my case, I go through back therapy. Um, the trust pays my bills. My wife had a crown fall out. She had to go to the dentist yesterday. Trust paid the bill. So that's important to know. So you're moving as many of your bills legitimately to the trust. And the trust will pay for, you know, home expenses, vehicle, gas maintenance, repairs, um, medical costs, charitable contributions. You can make donations from your trust. I gave to three organizations last year. Tuition, room and board at college up, up to age 24. So 23 years and 364 days. Wellness, phone, life insurance premiums. If you have life insurance, you do three forms. You change the owner of the policy to the trust, the beneficiary to being the trust, and then you do a change of the uh, account that's being paid from. I just got approved for two more life insurance policies in December that my trust is paying for. Now, if you make all those expenses, the trust expenses, then all you have left are the personal fun, food, and fashion. That, Those are expenses the trust cannot pay, fun, food, or fashion. So I actually have to change this. Many of the trust organizations have uh, under 21. So uh, Nexus is under 24. So I actually have to change that slide. Uh, well, actually, under 21, you can pay for the food or fashion of your beneficiaries. Um, and then 24 for them if they're in school. Now, people go, but then how do I pull out money for the fun, food, and fashion? I want to travel. I want to go to Europe. I want to pull money out. Well, that's a great question. So initially, you're not going to grant the assets to the trust. You are going to sell your assets to the trust. It, there's multiple ways to do that. You could sell it to the trust at cost or book value. If it's an investment property, what does the book value mean? That is your cost basis plus improvements minus any depreciation taken. You sell it at the book value. Now you have what's called a demand note with the trust. And the trust now owes you because the trust doesn't have any money when you sell the assets to the trust. So the trust now owes you that, that money for selling the asset. So in creating the demand note, you have the means to get funds from the trust. Each year, you can have the trust pay you a portion of the funds owed to you by that trust. You can pull it out monthly, any time of the year. And when you pull it out, you're going to have to pay what's called the applicable federal rate. That is the interest. The demand note requires that you, the trust owes you interest. And that's a rate that is determined. Um, through the applicable federal rate. So you're going to pay taxes on that interest, part of that income. In my case, what I do each year now is at the end of the year, I figure out how much taxes or how much interest the trust owes me. And I cut myself a check and I just report that as ordinary income tax. And it gives me more, 
money to do whatever I want with it. And even if I'm not pulling money out against the demand note. So that's that's one way you could do it. Another way is if you want a higher demand note, instead of selling, say, at book value or cost basis, you sell your assets at what's called reasonable value. So there is some capital gain in there. Now, your tax professional will report an installment sale when you do that, where the trust owes you principal, capital gains, and interest. So you only pay capital gains as you pull money out. Now, if you don't need to be pulling money out right away, you can wait until you have just Social Security income. You get yourself down to the 0% capital gains tax bracket, and you have even more money to pull out. So there's just ways, different ways to address this. Um, and that's where you have to look at your goals and your needs and work it out with the tax professional. And the tax professionals don't all, don't all agree. Some will say you have to do it at reasonable value. Some would say you have to do it at, um, you can do it at book value. So talk to me and then talk to tax professionals to figure out what would be the best approach for you. Now, by doing this, you might also increase the chance that your social security will not be taxed. Because if you are into the retirement mode, and if you have, say, four rental properties to help you with re retirement and you're able to defer the income taxes each year on those rental properties, now you will not go over the threshold that makes your Social Security, or we call it in our financial office, SOSO Security. You will not go over the threshold of which up to 85% of your Social Security becomes taxable. So there's a way to actually... Um, use this to enhance what you actually get from the Social Security. Important note, you no longer own the assets. It is a legacy plan for your beneficiaries. You are a caretaker of the estate. You're controlling everything as a caretaker of the estate. As the caretaker, you will pay what's called a caretaker-only lease for the room that you sleep in. Not the whole house, the room that you sleep in. And then you're also going to pay a lease for the vehicles that you drive, or you might pay mileage. And that is important because that eliminates the whole ac the, the accusation of it being self-dealing. Because if you're doing self-dealing, then they will say, no, this is a grantor trust and it's self-styled and therefore you don't get all these benefits. So you have to pay a lease. Now, some would say, you can deduct that from your demand note. In my case, I just cut a check. It's going into the trust. I control the money. You know, I don't mind paying that that lease because I have the resources to do that with other incomes. Now, real estate investors, this is important for you or if you're a real estate professional who has real estate investors, this is critical. This helps with the sale of assets. The trust sells the asset. So you have to set up the trust and sell the asset to the trust so that the trust can get this get the tax mitigation. The sales proceeds go to the trust. There are no restrictions as to when those funds are to be used. The key would be to not distribute the funds to the trustees or the beneficiaries. However, you can pay yourself a trustee salary for managing the trust, but you don't want to distribute to the beneficiaries because that's going to create a significant taxable event. You can choose to invest outside of real estate. Oh, this is great because you don't have to deal with the tenants, the trash, the toilets anymore. You can call your financial professional and say, I've got this 300000 or $3 million. Please put it in stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Or you can put it into cryptocurrency. You have the freedom to decide, because you're in control, how you want the trust to invest. Or you can still buy real estate, but you can, you can wait until you find the right fit. You don't have those 45 and 180 day restrictions that cause a lot of stress. You can sit on the funds for a year and then go buy because you found something that you really want to invest in. So it takes those stressors out. It takes those restrictions out. You can buy at the right time. Business owners, sale of business, there are multiple strategies available, but you can use trust to help to address the taxes with business sales as well. Sometimes it might even work to have a layered approach with uh, multiple strategies utilizing trust, maybe an LLC with charitable intent and different things like that. So 
this is very valuable. I am now a member of the California Business Brokers Association, looking to become a member of the International Association of Business Brokers, because this really helps in the sales of those uh, assets. By the way, getting back to the investor side, if you work with investors who are doing short-term flips and short-term active income taxes, this trust is a great way to mitigate a lot of that. You can defer up to 90% of those taxes if you're doing real estate flips. So it's a wonderful tool for investors. Wrap up. Why haven't I heard of this before? Well, that's a common question I get with a lot of strategies. And I often ask, when was the last time you went to coffee with a billionaire? <laughs> nah, never. And I say, well, your CPA, how many of, of the ultra wealthy like billionaires or people worth hundreds of millions of dollars do they do taxes for? Uh, none. Well, that's why. Because when you get in those circles, you start learning from each other. I've also been told that 99% per, per, of the trusts set up are revocable when they're set up, and only 1% are irrevocable when it's set up. Then of the irrevocable trusts, 99% follow grantor provisions, only 1% follow non-grantor provisions. And then of the non-grantor irrevocable trusts, 99% follow simple tax codes, and only 1% follow complex tax codes. That means you have 1% of the 1% of the 1%. That would also mean that you have to actually personally know 10,000 people with a trust to find one that has this type of trust. And how many people even know 10,000 people? I know 10,000 people that know me. I don't know them, but they know me. So that's where it's hard. And most CPAs are not even trained to do reporting on these types of trusts. So it's a small percentage of trusts that are out there and a small percentage of the tax professionals that even know about these, mostly because they are tax, they're plug and play tax preparers and not tax planners. Less than 5% of the tax professionals I've talked to are true tax planners. Now, I often hear, well, if it's too good to be true, it cannot be legal. Well, you know, what's kind of interesting is those who choose not to do legal tax strategies because this of this thinking, oh, it's too big, good to be true, are often the same people that complain when billionaires pay little taxes. For example, CNN Business wrote that Warren Buffett says that even though he and other top earners, the billionaires, are paying higher taxes this year, this is about 10 years ago, he still he thinks he is still paying a lower rate than his secretary. Can you imagine? I'm sure his secretary makes pretty good income. But we complain about how the wealthy are pay, paying very little taxes. And then we learn about strategies that help to mitigate those taxes. That we go, ah, oh, it's too good to be true. Well, then you're going to be stuck paying the taxes because of that kind of mindset. So you, you follow the laws, do the research. And the last question on that is, with your tax professional, are they a plug and play tax preparer or an active tax planner? There's a huge difference between the two. <laughs> There's also a huge cost difference. Now, what is the downside? The only downside that I'm aware of so far, along with the cost, because of the gut punch on the cost, is learning how to live out of the trust. There's very detailed record keeping and bookkeeping involved. You know, I have to, with the receipts from yesterday, I actually have to make notes on those receipts before I put it into my file. So there's record keeping involved. So if you don't want to complicate life, don't do the trust. If you want to take advantage of every opportunity to defer taxes, then do the trust. So that is one of the things. So many of my clients, they're trying to simplify life and this doesn't make sense for them. That's okay. You know, I'm going to be real honest with you. That's why I want to know your personality. Does it make sense? I've known 80-year-olds that go, boy, I'd love to do this. And 65-year-olds go, no, I just want to pay the tax and keep it simple. That's a personality thing. So basically, you can plan on being in a fog during the first year. You will have to talk to the trust organization. You're going to have to talk to your bookkeeper or the tax professionals to make sure you're doing things right. And always feel free to reach out to me. And I'll, if I have any insight, I'll give that to you. The great news is when you set up these trusts, 
some organizations will actually help you to implement the trust. You have all kinds of documents you have to deal with. You have to do sales contracts for assets going to the trust. You have to do, to do demand notes. You have to do leases, all of that. So you do have help that is that can be covered in the cost. Many organizations will actually set, sell you the trust document and then you're on your own. I don't like that. The organization I'm with actually helps to provide those services. So you basically, you watch this video. We, um, I'm going to send out a an email in a little bit that will have a document, excuse me, that you could read, a trust overview. So read those and then set up time with me and we'll talk it through to see if it's even a good fit for you. Now the pricing. With the organization I'm with, those the trust itself, with all the provisions, costs fifteen thousand dollars. So that helps you get set up, and you have an active trust. It's all the implementation that's going to cost you later. If you need to do a second trust, a business trust, that's going to be another trust book of fifteen thousand dollars. Then you do a package for the support that ranges from say seventy five hundred to forty two thousand, depending on how many corporate structures you have, how many real estate assets you have. It's not necessarily the doors because you might have a, a complex that has 10 doors, but that's one asset. So you, we have to figure out what that entails there in terms of the work. And I always like to downsell instead of upsell. So um, we have to take a close look at that. Now, with some of these packages, the top end packages, they'll include the first year's tax reporting for one or two trusts. Um, but typically, most of them do not include the tax reporting, and it does not include the bookkeeping. You can hire an independent bookkeeper, or you can um, do the bookkeeping yourself. We do bookkeeping ourselves, but I've had a conversation, multiple conversations with a bookkeeper that does the bookkeeping for the trust to make sure I'm staying on track with doing everything right. So, again, that's a gut punch, but when you think in terms of the actual tax mitigation and asset protection. I know of asset protection only trust that costs 15 grand. So just for the asset protection. So that is a, again, a gut punch, but it makes a lot of sense if you're going to be selling assets or you have a lot of income. Now, if you're having a hard time sitting in your seat right now, because you can see how this can be really valuable to your network of clients and friends or even your real estate team, if you're a real estate broker, you know, I'm always working to add to my team of consultants and affiliates. And not just for this strategy, but I also help affiliates around the country with their clients with other tax strategies as well. So feel free to set up time with me and we can talk through that. So here it is. We are at the end. Okay, so two QR codes. One is a calendar link. My consultations are free, so use and abuse my time. Please set up time to have a conversation. By the way, I suck as a closer. So I'm going to do what I can to inform you, to help you make the most educated decision that you can. And then if I can help you with strategies, then we will work together. But I am not going to be, I'm not one to try and push people into anything. So so it's a free consultation and you can have multiple free consultations with me while working through options. Now, we just launched last Friday a subscription service that goes beyond this. Um, it's really inexpensive. We're trying to educate people on a lot of things. Again, I have a living trust attorney talking about the dirty dozen uh, list of estate planning mistakes. We have a cost segregation Um professional that I've interviewed. I've also done some uh, interviews here with this trust. I've, I have a tax professional that does the tax reporting on these trusts. I've interviewed them on how the LLCs work with the trust, S-Corps work with the trust, um, C-Corps work with the trust, talk through his story with the no change letter and why that's important. So um, I'm also going to be interviewing an attorney on the attorney's perspective on that memorandum. So you can learn a lot that is out there. And we're continually adding to that. Our goal is to have about 500 uh, episodes by 2025, averaging about 10 minutes each.